This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On Thursday, October 24th, the Security Studies Committee held a breakfast roundtable on the topic PTSD, The Triumph Beyond Tragedy, featuring Lieutenant Colonel Chris Linford and Lieutenant Colonel Stéphane Grenier. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, there's a mic here, so I'll use it so I don't have to have to yell, but thanks very much. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, appreciate the invite here, and actually Martin, who just came in the door, was actually the one that got me here in the first place, or got all that started, so thank you very much to both of you, and thanks to everybody who came out this morning to hear this story. I'm here um, solo this morning without my, my lovely bride, Catherine. Um, we're currently on a speaking tour uh, across Canada promoting the book, but actually speaking more about the impact of PTSD on our family, something that uh, she and I are both experts at. Um, we're, we're traveling across the country, hosted by Military Family Resource Centers across Canada, kindly hosting us and um, setting up all of the speaking events in their, in their cities, communities, etc. And it is we are just amazed at the people that are coming out to this that want to hear our story. And it's been a pleasure to, um, to tell them our story. And it's incredible to see all the heads nodding in the, in the audience. And I don't mean nodding off to sleep. I mean nodding that they're going, oh my God, that guy's talk he's telling my life. And I just can't believe it. So it's, our story is very common across the military community. Uh, there's uh, at least one of you in uniform in here uh, this morning, probably several other military hidden under shirt and tie um, that will relate to what I have to say. I will apologize ahead of time that I have converted some of what my wife would have said to you into um, what I will say to you. And uh, I've tried to change very little of what she would have said. Um, with that, I'll just get going. Uh, other than to mention that, that is my, the cover of my book, and I do have a few copies I was able to bring with me this morning. If you are interested, I can sell them at a uh, good price for a fine Canadian friend this morning after the event. If you're wondering, that is me on the front cover in silhouette. I put it like that so that anyone who is silently suffering with PTSD might be able to imagine themselves in that position. And you can interpret it whatever way you want with the angry sky and the light and all that corny stuff. So anyway, whatever you want to do. But it is my story of essentially a journey to PTSD and back again. So post-traumatic stress disorder, as we all know, is an injury that has existed for a long, long time. It's been called many, many different things. PTSD is now what we refer to it as, uh, or, and, and it falls under the category of an operational stress injury. But I would say that it's probably relatively recently that we have actually tried to figure it out more and what you know, has caused it and what maybe even we can do about it, which is quite encouraging. I feel that I've come along with my PTSD at the right time, although I've, I'm coming up on my 20-year mark of having PTSD next summer. Uh, ever since I got back from uh, Rwanda in 1994. So I plan to speak to you today not just about my PTSD, but I want to tell you about how it impacted my family, and I'll introduce you to them in just a second. Because it was, it was when I finally realized it was not just me that needed the care, it was my family actually that needed it as well. And I finally had my, my mind opened to that fact um, and when, once I got that, I can tell you the, my mind um, opened up to a whole new level of healing because I had to achieve a certain level of healing, first of all, to even be able to recognize something outside of my own belly button. And once I got to that point, then I could start to figure out, you know what, I have a wife and I have three kids who have also been injured as a result of my PTSD. So the fine-looking young gentleman on, the, on your left in the Army uniform is, is our son, Jeffrey, who's currently serving with one CER in Edmonton, so that's Combat Engineer Regiment. He did the last nine-month combat mission in Afghanistan. That uh, was two rotos after my tour there, and I can tell you that my wife and I refer to that time period as the, as the nine months we did not breathe. 
he worked outside the wire doing counter ied and all the stuff that young men love to think about doing and parents dread it's my wife catherine our daughter jennifer who doesn't look at all like her mother um, she is a university student in Edmonton, uh, taking photography, not a military bone in her blessed body, so she will never wear the uniform. Our son, uh, Victor, who is uh, in the Air Force, obviously, and is currently a flight engineer with 408 Tactical Helicopter Squadron in Edmonton. Living the dream, flying every day, um, his dad's pretty jealous. And then, uh, and then me. So yes, I've written this book, here it is. It's not just a, a pretty slide, it's got words and everything. Um, so if you are interested, it's, uh, it's available at the end. So I just wanted to say uh, right off the bat as well that uh, you know, Catherine and I have been married for 27 years, um, of which 25 have been spent in the regular force the last 25 years. We've been on different bases across this country and in the U.S. moving pretty much every two to three years, which is a little bit quicker than the average for uh, military families. But um, I have some theories as to why I got moved around a little bit quicker. I like to think it's because I mastered what I was doing and they wanted to move me on. There may be some other opinions about that. I just wanted to, to start off this talk today by just establishing ourselves as a fair, what I would say a fairly average military couple, three kids and moving around a lot. Um, so I needed to write this book for a couple of reasons, and one of the reasons were all these people on the screen here. Um, but I re it came about as, as a, a possibility to open the door for some healing for me. My, my clinical therapist, Dr. Kate Diskin at the mental health clinic in uh, Victoria, uh, <coughs> wanted me to start writing down uh, my traumas during my therapy and just quick notes uh, it started off very small just write a sentence when you get triggered write down what triggered you why why it triggered you and then what what you thought about while you were being triggered and um, essentially that they, they started to grow uh, and become short stories and that sort of thing and I can tell you that it was very cathartic to do that to actually not only think about it but then to start to break it down into um, to give it some structure, some context, because, as, uh, because PTSD memories for me have none of that. No start, no finish, no context. And to actually start to define it and put it into a structure was very powerful for me. And it, it, get, it started to give me that first element of control over those intrusive memories that I was experiencing. And I can tell you that from that came this book. So, as I said, it marked a significant point in my healing as I was able to finally articulate the many traumas as well as describe how they impacted me. So I wasn't just talking about the war story and everything that, was, that happened that day. I had to start to examine, okay, how do, how do I feel about what, about what I'm thinking about? What, what does it feel like right here? What does it feel like here? And it sounds like it would be painful to do that, and I and I can share with you that it was it was not fun uh, to to try and think about that stuff in detail because I can tell you for the previous 18 years at that point I was on the path to try and forget all that stuff to avoid it, and I had to learn that avoidance therapy was probably the worst thing that you could do, and in fact it has actually perpetuated the stigma that we we suffer from to this day with a lot of different mental health illnesses. So I did it for my family and friends so they could finally under understand some of what I lived through. The book has been interesting. Uh, when my mother read the book, she would call me about every few pages and say, did you just make that up? That couldn't have really happened. And I, yeah, yeah, it happened. And then, she, and then she said to me one day, what is with those people in Rwanda? <laughs> I said, Mom, if you figure it out, give me a call, because I don't know. But uh, it, so it was, you know, my family was, had heard many of the war stories that are in the book, because those are the easiest things for soldiers to tell. But they didn't know all the other stuff, how, how I felt about what happened, what I observed in some of the other people that were on the tour with me, how they reacted, how I integrated myself into, into their care. So it's funny, I, uh, I, I really wrote the book for you as well as the Canadian public. Um, it's time that the Canadian public 
really started to understand what happens on some of these missions we go to. Um, you may have noticed that uh, many uh, what the media presents uh, of the Afghanistan conflict are eight second sound bites of usually guys dressed in arid CAD pad shooting over a concrete wall. Uh, I mean, that's almost the, the only videotape we see of that war. So when people find out that I was in Afghanistan, I imagine that that's probably what they thought I was doing. And of course, I never stood next to an, a, a concrete wall with a C7 rifle, and I certainly never shot over it. So they didn't understand that my job there was, I was working in the Roll 3 Combat Surgical Hospital, inside the wire. I went outside the wire a couple of times, and that was only to visit another hospital, an Afghan hospital. So that was my job in 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 Afghanistan. We were inside the wire, and when bad things happened to people in Afghanistan, they were brought to me. So that was, you know, that's sort of, I guess they referred to, they referred to the, the hospital in Afghanistan as sort of the shit magnet of, of Afghanistan, because if you're having a bad day, you're coming, you're coming to the roll three. So that was our combat. Our combat started right when that poor soul, who's been either blown up or shot or otherwise, um, ends up flown to our front door, and that's our combat for our unit. That's the way we make a living, is dealing with those folks. So I started to feel better through my, through my treatment, and I uh, really enjoyed the, the feeling of, of speaking to other uh, folks uh, as well, just uh, off the cuff kind of conversations. I'd meet the odd person that was uh, going through the same thing if they dared share it with me uh, and whatnot. And I, could, I certainly felt that uh, I, I started to feel better the more I talked about it with a couple of other folks. I was working for the Soldier On uh, program, uh, which is a CF-sponsored program that gets veterans that are injured um, back into sporting activities, etc. And so I was doing some work with them. And I met a guy by the name of Dr. Marv Westwood, who is the former clinical director of the Veterans Transition Program that was then sponsored by the University of British Columbia. He's one of those psychologists that could just get into your head in a matter of 10 seconds, and he started asking you, you questions, and he was triggering the hell out of me, and he, but, it, but it's, I was I remained curious about where he was going, and, and he said to me, uh, Chris, you know, your story, you've you know, done these tours, and you've been injured for such a long time, and you're, you've done therapy, and you're getting well, he says, That's, it's an amazing story, and it needs to be told, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I thought, well, I sort of have thought about it, but never really put any serious thought to it. And he says, can you write it by May? And this was January. And, and I said, of this year? <laughs> and he said, yeah. He says, that, he says Chris, this, this book is, is not going to be about you. It's about who it will help. And, you know, I just sat back and looked up and to the right, and I thought, that is really what I needed to hear this morning. That just gave me this incredible new focus that, because I was, I, I was starting to enjoy that paying it forward because I was getting well through my therapy and I was speaking to other veterans and they seemed to be getting something from that exchange and then I was getting something from the exchange. Wow, if I wrote a book, I could get to a lot of people and if Christmas is coming, maybe a lot of people will get it under the tree. So, I mean, this is a great way to pay it forward to actually get my word down on paper and get it into people's homes. So the whole, so I was very inspired. I sat down that January and started to type at my computer. Um, and in six months, I didn't make it by May, but I made it by the end of June of that year, I, I got the first draft done. And it spent the, the next year in, in edit, because I'm a lousy writer. But um, I'm more of a red crayon on a field message pad kind of guy. So I, I spent a year editing, and then I hired a really good editor as well to, to help that out. So the book is out since, uh, has been out since July. It's gaining popularity. It was on the publisher's bestsellers list for almost uh, three months and, and doing well. And I'm getting, I'm getting messages from people as far away as Okinawa, Japan, and all over the UK. And and Europe who, have, who are buying the book and reading it and, and sending me notes as to how the book is impacting them because they're seeing themselves in my, in, in my story. 
and they are, it's resonating with people. People have come up to me at the end of, after I speak, and they said, you know, as a result of hearing you speak today and the impact that PTSD had on your family and some of the things you share, I have decided to forgive my father, who I have not spoken to in over two years, because he's such a jerk. But he's a veteran, and he did a lot of tours, and I now understand why he's such a jerk. I need to go and talk to him. People have come up to me and said, the letter you wrote from, wrote, you read from your daughter impacted me so much that I'm going to go home and talk to my kids tonight. And my wife Catherine and I, we consider this just the most amazing win because we're actually getting people to have different conversations than they've ever had. To consider maybe for the first time that their PTSD impacted more than themselves. It actually hurt other people around them, and now they're going to have this conversation that they would have never considered having. So that's a big win. I discovered through my personal journey as well that I, that I was not alone, and I'll talk a little bit more about the peer piece and how that impacted me when I finally got into that. But I, I absolutely learned um, fairly early in my treatment uh, that I would need more than just myself and my therapist sitting in her tiny little office to get well again. I would need my family and I would need my community. We've been frustrated about, Catherine and I have been frustrated about the level of secrecy surrounding this injury and, and feel that it's time we as veterans and families and communities at large actually start to speak openly and candidly about this injury. We have learned that the level of honesty that you must achieve as a couple and as a community is very is, is a high level and you have to just, in order to reduce the stigma that surrounds this injury and prevents people from talking, we have to get beyond it. We have to get to the point where we may even tempt to forget that this injury was ever stigmatized at all. And, we need, and, by, and by speaking openly and honestly about it, we can actually achieve that. So essentially, what happens is uh, we, we need to get to the 800 pound elephant in the room because that's, that's what it is, that's how I see it anyway. It's like everybody's looking away from the center of the room where this big 800 pound elephant is lumbering about. Um, and and we, that perpetuates the stigma of not, of not talking about it, which means, oh, if we talk about it, it must be bad if we talk about it. And because I wanna talk about it but can't, I now, feel stig I now feel shame and fear, which perpetuates the stigma surrounding this injury. So we have to just grab onto that elephant <laughs> and hug the hell out of it to, to get to the point where we can feel comfortable with uh, speaking about this, this injury. And that has driven a lot of why, we, why I wrote the book and why we're on this cross-country speaking tour, and the good news is people are showing up and filling every seat in the house when we come and talk, whether they be clinicians or whether they be families or veterans suffering, they all come and they all want to hear about it, and hopefully they start thinking and talking about it. Now this story that I'm going to tell you is, uh, is a very personal one, it's my wife Catherine and I. Uh, something has happened to us as a couple over the last two years that has reconnected us in a way that we had never previously been connected as a couple. So something has changed within us. It's like a little blue wire in my brain just all of a sudden got attached. And now we, I, I hear her and I see her in a different way, which has been very um, comforting. Long has it been assumed that, you know, we should just not ever talk about this stuff. I can remember the first Remembrance Day in, uh, after I was back from Afghanistan. So the November 11th of 2010, I was in Victoria. I was, in, I was the commanding officer for the, the health unit there. And I was, had a lot of responsibilities that day with media stuff. And I had to be on, okay? And I'm in uniform. I didn't even want to wear my uniform that day. I felt absolutely horrific. My family was all there, and I was sitting in the Legion after most of it was done, and I was spent. And the only thing I had on my mind that day were the faces of the young people I saw die over the previous year in Afghanistan. 
could not, could not get them out of my head. Uh, despite all of these amazing responsibilities I had that day, I could not get their faces, their eyes, any of that out of my head. My father was sitting across from me and he said, Chris, you, you know, what's going on? You know, clearly I was not myself. <laughs> so I told him a little bit, not with as much detail as I just told you, but I said, I had some, some really bad things on my mind today. And, and he said, he turned to me and he said, you know, trying to be helpful. He said, well, you know, just don't think about that stuff. Okay, thanks. <laughs> that, for nothing. You know, that, that just didn't do it, of course. And anybody who suffers from PTSD knows that you can't just not think about it. It's in your head. And it consumed me. I was still, I was in therapy at the time and doing well, but, you know, November 11th is just one of those days for many of us in uniform, especially given the previous year that I had seen <coughs> young people the age of my son, Jeffrey, um, get killed or get blown to pieces and, and come home less uh, physically. So through my healing, I have discovered many things, but one of the most important is that an open and honest discussion about this, uh, about this issue is the magic medicine here. There is no magic blue pill, but there is some magic medicine that if you do, you can increase your chances of getting well. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, is what the military offers, and, that, and I was fully engaged with that, and I fully signed on to the process, and I demanded the absolute most from my clinical team and of myself, because I absolutely wanted to be well. I was, I was fully engaged. Um, I submitted to the process, if you will, and that is what is, what is really required here. Uh, you can't go halfway. you got to go all the way. I wanted desperately to be well again, at a minimum, fully submitting to the process and, the, and getting to that level of honesty is the answer to get well. So slowly over time, I began to use some techniques that they taught me, like, you know, breathing exercises and just noting your triggers and trying not to decisively engage with them and, and concentrating on getting through them. I got into meditation. Uh, which has been a savior for me. Um, I use it uh, every day and absolutely got, got it to the point where I could achieve a meditative state in relatively short order with a few very well-placed trigger type words that would get me there and would help me to manage my anxiety when I was triggered. The idea was to not really distract myself but just to gain, start to gain some control over these memories as they hit me. So my ability to engage these, uh, these techniques built slowly. It doesn't happen by Tuesday. It happens over weeks and months and sometimes longer. Sometimes there were setbacks. In fact, there were frequent setbacks. They were devastating because you just get to that point when you're so injured and you get very optimistic about, oh, I've got this new technique and it really worked yesterday, but damn it, it just totally did not work today. And that just... When you're, when you're so sensitive about how you're feeling, um, that just throws you, throws you right off the horse. It's devastating. This, these types of things, of course, manifested themselves probably more at home than they did at work. Because at work, I put on the uniform, you, it's, like a, it's like a suit of armor you wear, and you definitely don't want to show any of your troops that you're not feeling well. But often, often we don't have any problem showing our wife and kids that we are not feeling well. There were times when I thought I would never get well again and, uh, or have a normal life or even be able to work. I, I knew I was probably going down despite the fact that I was on all of this therapy. So the PTSD had left me feeling as though I had actually lost my identity as Chris Linford. And I can tell you that I, I felt at times that I had lost my soul as a, as a human being. I had witnessed some of the worst of what man will do to man in this world, and I felt as though I was watching it from a place well outside my own body. I was extremely dissociated from who I was, and that's probably why I felt I had lost my identity. It was like I was floating above myself, dissociated and completely disconnected with who I ever was. I did not under my, understand myself anymore at all. 
It was very, it's very hard to explain this to somebody to get them to the point where they might understand and not even, and you know, and maybe not think that you're crazy. So what do we do when we have PTSD and we feel this way? We probably don't talk about it. And that's where a lot of the self-isolating techniques happen, or uh, self-isolating happens. We don't want to tell people how we're feeling because it sounds weird, doesn't it? It doesn't sound normal. It doesn't sound right. And I'm certainly not comfortable with feeling that way. And why would I share that with you? So I'm going to go down into the basement. I'm going to turn on my computer and I'm going to take that bottle of scotch with me because that'll make me feel better at least for a while. And that sadly is what happens a lot. So I knew my behavior was off and I knew Catherine and the kids could see it. I just didn't have the energy or ability at the time to speak about it openly. As a result, I believe that Catherine and the kids suffered a great deal thinking that perhaps they were somehow responsible for what dad was doing, the way dad was. Through all that, I think my body and mind were trying to protect me by isolating and it certainly did nothing for the, the marital connection. Catherine and I were struggling quite a bit with just even speaking about normal stuff other than the weather. Um, we had always been closely connected as a couple and could really talk about anything and that just faded to nothing. And it was sad, yet I was so consumed by my PTSD and my healing process that I, I felt at times I'd be quite willing to sacrifice my marriage over it because I didn't have the energy for that. I had the energy to try and get well, but couldn't find the energy for my marriage. So just so you understand, a PTSD memory for me, or I call it a movie because it, it's kind of what it's like in my brain, it's a short loop of memory that would spin, that when triggered, would spin over and over in my head without context, without start, without finish. It was completely random and incredibly real and essentially would bring me right back to that place where I got that trauma in the, uh, initially. So it would bring me right back to the war zone. So um, it was always full of devastating details. These are just a few pictures from Rwanda. There was never, there was a never, it was, it was never ending. So it would just come up over the back of my head and into the front of my mind as I was triggered and settle in for a nasty ride with full color, full sound and smells of that day. I could even smell what was in my head. Many, some of the triggers for me were very loud sounds like a, like, you know, a door of a blue rocket slamming or, uh, uh, a siren on an ambulance uh, suddenly firing up uh, fireworks. Also, and probably not surprising to you, black children would trigger the heck out of me whenever I saw one in the street. Backpacks, crowds, dead animals, and probably one of the most significant triggers for me is the sight and smell of blood or raw flesh, not surprisingly after coming out of the Roll 3 hospital. And I would say to you that smell was likely the most powerful of all my triggers that could get me right back to either Rwanda or Afghanistan in, in mere seconds. So not surprisingly, the tendency was to avoid all these at all cost. I did that for years, 10 years after Rwanda. Um, and, and, uh, but all through that time, the smell of blood or the sight of a small black child would send me into memories I would instantly feel super hyper aroused, high level of anxiety. It was like a big rubber band tied around my chest and somebody was in the back just tightening it and tightening it and tightening it until I felt like my head was going to explode. It would build, this pressure would build in my center and would permeate my head and my, and, and my, the rest of my body. I was sometimes so overwhelmed that I would just leave locations unexpectedly and um, just to distract myself and get away from it. I needed to avoid it. So my anger and anxiety would build, mostly anger at myself, but I would, I would impose that anger upon those around me. I would feel quite peaked and usually lose a night of sleep that night and I would feel terrible for a good day or so. So I would try to keep going, and I did for a long time. I'm a very, very good actor, probably Academy Award worthy. I can, I can uh, make people believe I am doing very well. 
and I did for about 10 years. I used uh, my uniform, I used my rank, I used my sense of humor, my charisma, my whatever I needed, I would use to hide that from the people I worked with. And I was extremely successful. This is an action I believe that many veterans do. We're quite used to doing that sort of thing. And even our families contribute to that because they learn to make excuses for us too when we're at that family gathering and all of a sudden their husband has to get up and leave the room quickly or he says something completely inappropriate and, the, and gets up and leaves and then the family makes an excuse for him. And then guess what? They never talk about it. So that perpetuates the whole issue. The family is usually frightened to speak about it or bring it up at all is what I've found. So I did this for almost 10 years until I guess I, I had my, what I consider, I guess, a meltdown in Borden, Ontario. I was the deputy commandant of the medical school there. Pretty important job and uh, pretty much kind of the principal of the school, running lots of med techs through their training and nurses and docs and whatnot. Um, I was really busy, but I just had this meltdown one day. I had over about a 90 day period lost my ability to sleep. Now this was 10 years after Rwanda. I didn't initially make the connection with my deployment to Rwanda at all. And I just all of a sudden couldn't sleep at night. And this started by losing one hour of sleep, then two, and well, I can deal with that, and then lose three hours. Then all of a sudden I'm only getting an hour of sleep. Well, let me tell you, that makes for a long night, and then you string a bunch of those in a row, and it doesn't, you can imagine, it doesn't take long before you start to go down without getting any sleep. I knew that day that I could no longer sustain what I had been doing. All of my armor was failing and I was going down very, very hard and very, very fast. I had lost my ability to sleep, which of course is my slippery slope. Once I lose that, all the PTSD starts to come back with a vengeance. So I knew I needed, I needed help. I sat at my desk not knowing what to do next. I had completely lost my sense of business, my sense of leadership, and I felt I was a different person, just completely incapable of leading my team. I, I got up, I closed the door to my office, isolating myself, and I can remember weeping for several minutes. This was totally out of character for me. I had never done that before. I, but I knew then that my life and career was probably going to be changed forever, and I had absolutely no idea what the future would bring. I was desperate and I realized I could no longer do it alone. I would need my community. I finally, it's my first point of submission to my injury, where I finally realized I could not do this by myself. So I got some help that day from a very understanding base surgeon at the time who immediately plugged me into help. It took over a year of therapy. Uh, it was in 2004 to five. And and I was put on meds, uh, diagnosed with uh, PTSD and depression, and I was given some great drugs for sleeping so I could finally sleep seven, eight hours a night again. What a joy that was to finally get that back. Did I resent having to take drugs? I rarely took drugs in my life. I took a Tylenol when I had a headache and only after you know, a long time of suffering with the pain. I was fairly relentless with that stuff. Didn't like pills, didn't want to take pills. And so now I've got to take pills, not only for sleep, but for depression. And uh, that was an interesting experience, but I'm really glad that I had that uh, because essentially what it did is it allows you to get your brain glued back together while you do the therapy that's required. So after that year of treatment, I, I felt better and I felt uh, uh, the interest in my military career come back. I wasn't going to lose my career because let's face it, that was, that was my biggest fear because uh, the military doesn't like guys that are injured like that and they're, they tend to release you. <laughs> so I, I felt very fortunate that I was getting all that back. So my family had been struggling along through this time as well, and I had no idea what they knew or suspected was going on. So I decided to have a family meeting at our house in Barry to explain things to them. So the three kids were all young teenagers and, uh, and really didn't understand what was going on. So recently our daughter Jennifer wrote a paper at university. Uh, she's attending Grant McEwen. 
And she wrote of that day that I sat them down in Barry in 2004. So she would have been about 11 or 12 years old. <coughs> so I, with her permission, I'll read you a portion of the letter she wrote to me six months ago. So now she's 22. And if you'll bear with me, I will try and get through parts of this letter. It's, it's a, kind of a heavy letter for a dad. <clears throat> so she writes... There are certain stories in our family. Some are happy, some are sad, some are life lessons, and some even change your life entirely. My dad was deployed to the first Gulf War as well as Rwanda and Afghanistan. You couldn't imagine what doing three tours in a war zone would do to someone. The stories he told us after he got back were what made me so proud of him. He was my hero. The unfortunate thing about these stories was that they hid the hideous truth of what really happened to him. Like many soldiers do, my dad suffered alone for, a ten, for 10 long years. His life began to unravel and he couldn't control it. Worst of all, he didn't know why. My brothers and I sat on our couch wondering what was about to happen. My dad sat next to us and to be honest, we all thought we were in some sort of trouble. He told us he had been diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I thought to myself, what the heck is that? But I said nothing. He tried to explain as best he could, but I don't think I heard a word he said. I only noticed the tears running down his face. I had never seen my dad cry before that day. He was always so strong. He always kept those emotions hidden. I knew that this moment was important to him and it will be important to our family later to come, but I didn't understand what it all meant. I was always too afraid to ask the important questions. I love my dad and he was my hero, but I was afraid of him. I think I was afraid of his illness. The seven months my dad was in Afghanistan were peaceful for me. It was just my mother and me and I was working full time and didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. When my dad got home, he came down on me like an iron fist. On top of everything, I got fired from my job and blew all of my money for university like an idiot. He was not impressed with me. His being in a PTSD state propelled any situation into life or death. I couldn't do anything right. My parents quickly moved out of province and I decided to stay. Much of my decision had to do with my father. I don't want to blame him, but I did not want to be around him. I didn't know how to be around him. He was re-diagnosed with PTSD in 2010. How could I have been so naive to think that that sort of thing would just go away? I was finally old enough to start to understand what was going on. Unlike before, when I was in sixth grade, I began to be interested in his disorder. I wanted to be part of his healing process, and I wanted to help in any way that I could. PTSD has been a part of our family's lives for almost 20 years. It's a story that continues to this day. My dad's PTSD has a new life to it now. It is no longer a burden. It is merely a part of his past that he works every day to keep in the past. It will always be there, but for now he is a success story of how he went to war with PTSD and won the battle for his mental health. <coughs> I learned later from my kids that they often never even brought their kids around, our, their friends around our house for fear of what I might do or say. They didn't want to be embarrassed by me. I was not ever violent with them, but I fear the damage done to our relationships through the things that I may have said to them or the attitudes that I may have had from time to time truly hurt them. I truly thought everything was okay, and in fact, I thought I had a pretty good relationship with my kids. But in fact, they had been just telling me what they felt I needed to hear. <clears throat> it seems the PTSD had me quite fooled in a completely unexpected way. And of course, all this time, my wife Catherine had been the buffer between the kids and I, and even between us. Catherine was typical in that she didn't really know what was happening with me. I certainly wasn't sharing anything with her. So before my diagnosis in 2004, Catherine and I had been married for 18 years. 
She began to notice changes in me right after Rwanda in 1994, but she didn't know much about PTSD or stress injuries at the time. Neither did any of us. She never made the connection between my deployment and my mood issues. In short, she didn't know what she didn't know. She actually just thought things were going along fine or normal for a military family. With all the moving and changes, she thought my behavior was just something else that we all were going to have to adapt to, figure out how to manage. I had always been uh, a bit on the impatient side, uh, but she noticed that I had gotten much worse. I like things done my way, and I would get very agitated if they, um, especially the kids, didn't conform to what I wanted. So they, the kids tend, tended to do what I wanted. She gauged my mood before giving me any news that might upset me, like a bad report card or something like that. She would just wait till I was in a better frame of mind. So this was our family business. She hadn't shared any of this with our friends or family or, uh, or, any, or used any of the military resources around us. In hindsight, she of course wishes she had reached out. And sadly, during our deployment in, or our posting in Borden in 2002 to 2004, she was a volunteer at the Borden MFRC and had the resources at her fingertips to help herself and the kids, but she chose not to engage. She didn't want to look like she couldn't handle her own family. It was also the way I felt. She felt she was stronger than that and didn't want to be a burden to anyone. I had no clue she felt this way at all, and likely if I had, I'm not really sure I would have been supportive of her going forward and revealing that we were struggling. At that time, there wasn't a lot of talk about PTSD, and she thought what she was dealing with was just normal for a military family. That was the reality back then. But today, I think we generally know more about PTSD, but I would suspect it's more the stigma surrounding mental health in general that's preventing families from getting the help they need. Now after that year of, of treatment and medication, I was feeling good again, and I adjust, once I adjusted to my new medications, things calmed down and we got back to a normal, fairly normal family life. We were posted to Scott Air Force Base in Illinois on an exchange posting where Catherine and the kids dove into their new lives and for the most part loved it. They were involved with, uh, they got involved with a busy high school marching band. Both my kids got into that with a vengeance and Catherine became a band mom. And they uh, took off essentially with the school pretty much every weekend and explored every nook and cranny of Southern Illinois and Missouri. So it kept them busy and occupied and not really at home much, which suited me fine because I was gone at least half the time in my new job with uh, U United States Transportation Command. She distracted herself and life carried on for us. We were living in a beautiful world of denial and we never spoke of my PTSD again until after Afghanistan. It's interesting to me now to think of those times as I was still so incredibly unhappy and unhealthy with PTSD, even while posted down in the US. But I had convinced the base surgeon up in Borden that I was ready for this exchange posting. I had done a year of therapy, and I think in typical military mindset, right, I have a mission, I need to get be cured of PTSD, right? I've done meds for a year, I've done therapy for a year, gone, behind me, moving forward, let's go. Sadly, it's not very realistic and not really the way it works. I think it's fairly common among CF veterans to think that way, especially those of us who are very driven and want certain things out of life. I hadn't yet figured out the level of honesty that I would actually need to become healthy again. And that wouldn't come to me until after Afghanistan. I also told my family what they, I thought they needed to hear so that they wouldn't worry about me. I was still triggered a lot and frequently frustrated with life in the U.S. Those of you that have done an exchange posting down there with U.S. troops, it can be painful because they, they sort of treat you like you're a pet if you're not from the U.S. So uh, it, was just, it was just friggin' miserable is what it was. Um, so imagine having PTSD and trying to go, oh, there's nobody here. Anyway, whatever. Um, yeah, it was miserable. Um, 
It's funny, my wife, if, I, if you asked my wife what was your favorite posting, she'd say Illinois, and I'd say definitely not Illinois. So, um, I, con- I had convinced myself that my PTSD was cured, so I was living in a state of denial as well. So that denial continued through our next posting to One Field Am in Edmonton, uh, where I was, uh, I, was, I was promoted and made the, the commanding officer of One Field Am. I was thrilled. And for a long time, I was really distracted with all of the duties that come with being a CEO. So I didn't really have much time for PTSD. And uh, I, was, I was certainly very busy. Uh, we were at war in Afghanistan. As I arrived there, Roto 5 was just going out the door. So it was, there were quite a few challenges over the, that following year. Um, I lost two medics uh, from my unit killed in action uh, during that roto. Um, and I actually dealt with those uh, fairly well. Um, and I, wrote, I write about those in, in my book because I was worried about myself. How, if that happened, how would I be able to respond? And those of you in the room who have been COs, and I know there's a couple of you in here, you know all of the the stress that comes with that, dealing with (coughs) a bereaved family. So the denial continued on through our next posting, and uh, Catherine and the kids just carried on. Catherine got a great job in Edmonton. Jeff and Victor joined the military, and Jen was finishing high school. And I was gone a good portion of the year prior to my deployment to Kandahar in 2009, and we just did what every other military family does, we just carry on. So things didn't really come to a head until I got back from Afghanistan. I knew my PTSD was back. I knew halfway through my mission my PTSD was back. And I was secretly seeing a U.S. Navy doc uh, who was outside of the Canadian Forces Health Services system prescribing drugs to me so that I could get to the end of my tour. Because I knew that if I went to a Canadian doc, I would probably be repatriated, sent home, because they would see what was going on with me. So he agreed with me, and I've vowed to keep his name secret to my dying day. Maybe it'll be a deathbed confession, but I won't tell anybody who he was that prescribed me and got me drugs to get me to the end of my tour, because there was no way, no way I would come home early and leave my troops in Afghanistan. And those of you that are COs will, have been COs, will understand where that comes from. I didn't care how sick I was. As long as I was getting one or two hours of sleep a night, that was good enough for me. The job was busy enough, seven days a week, 12, 14, 16 hours a day, whatever it took, that kept me going. Plus I had a really good command master chief, it was like an RSM, only a US Navy style, and he kept me in the gym every morning, just no matter what was going on, we went to the gym every morning and that was some of the best medicine that I could have done, was lift weights and run on the stupid treadmill every morning. So things didn't come to a head until I got back. Uh, like I said, I knew I was, I knew, I knew my, my PTSD was back, and I accepted another CO job in Victoria. Things began to slip, and my ability to cope was way down. Our connection as a couple felt strained, and things just seemed to get harder and harder. Leaving the kids behind impacted her. Catherine more than it, than me and, and more than I would have expected. She left a great job that she really enjoyed and was really good at and she was feeling a bit of resentment towards me and coupled with my PTSD symptoms of isolation and anger, our connection as a couple was floundering big time. I sourced care for my PTSD right away in Victoria because I knew I needed it. I was making light of it at home, so Catherine didn't really know that I was not feeling well again, but she probably suspected it, and I certainly minimized the severity of my situation. I just didn't have the energy to engage in the conversation with Catherine, and I felt I would probably be negatively judged by her. So I was very different. I was frustrated with everything. I was hypervigilant, especially in crowded places. I struggled even with my friends, people that we knew. I didn't even want to be around them. I was angry and I had difficulty managing even small amounts of stress. I thrashed out in my sleep just about every night, often hitting and kicking Catherine. Um, she says I never hurt her, but in fact I probably just about broke my toe one night off her kneecap. But I, and I, but I absolutely felt terrible. That's the part that was worse. The physical pain from, from that was nothing compared to how bad I felt for thrashing out and, and striking her. My confidence dropped to a level that I would not have ever expected. 
We didn't communicate well. I was quiet and withdrawn, as was Catherine. And for those of you that know us as a couple, that would be very out of character. She began to feel as though that this was somehow her fault. She's not certain why she felt that way, but I believe it's common for spouses to take on some blame when it comes to this. She was confused and frustrated with me and felt very much alone, and I was just not there. To show how confused she was, she sometimes even felt jealous of my PTSD. She suspected it was just another way I was bringing attention to myself. That's how strange this was. She knew me very well and knew that that was not my MO, but she thought that this is, I'm bringing attention to myself. I thought, why would I do that? Anyway, we laugh about that one now. She had given up living close to the kids in Edmonton for this job that she really loved to move to Victoria with me to be friggin' miserable. The wedge between, between us was just getting bigger and bigger. And it wasn't until... It wasn't until several months later in the early part of 2011 when I finally told Catherine of my significant thoughts of suicide. She began to understand just how serious this was. I could tell there was a palpable change in our relationship when I finally told her about this. I arranged a meeting with my therapist who explained what PTSD was to Catherine and what it could do to people. She had refused any contact with my therapist or any help, any resources to that point but this somehow changed it. That was the day she truly recognized what PTSD was and that I had it. That was the, the 18 year mark of me having PTSD where she finally feels that she started to understand the impact of it. Our connection at that point was extremely strained and things didn't get better overnight. It would take many more months of just trying to listen to each other and give each other the benefit of the doubt to get through this. We learned that Catherine needed to take care of herself as well. She attended some self-discovery sessions that helped her establish some new direction in her life and make, things, make a few things clearer in her mind about our relationship and now how she fits in. The effort on Catherine's part led to a much greater understanding of PTSD and why I was the way I was. We needed to change how we spoke to each other and, how, and to remove judgment from, the, from our day. She went to a psychologist for several sessions. She needed to discover more about how she fit into our relationship. She was floundering terribly at times and, and really needed some me time as well. This was important work for her as it further clarified where we needed to go with our relationship. We started to connect again with a whole new energy and spirit of cooperation. The resentment she felt for me began to fade because she understood this was very real and was then able to forgive me for what happened. It wasn't really me, it was the PTSD. This new realization seemed to open the door to discussion again about many things. We were able to listen, vice judge. It seemed that a whole new spirit of honesty was now in the room with us. This was what we needed to take the next step in being supportive of one another, vice suspicious and non-trusting. PTSD is a big problem to conquer and doing it together just all of a sudden seemed very achievable. This was a huge pivot point for us. I began to understand the impact of my PTSD on my family for the very first time, also at the 18 year mark of my PTSD. This fact has been a major driving force in the writing of Warrior Rising and, cer and certainly the speaking tour that we're on that we do jointly. I mentioned earlier my thoughts of suicide, and I just want to spend a little bit more on that, as is quite common with PTSD and depression. Firstly, you should understand, though, that these thoughts came well before Catherine and I discovered our, this new connection between us. It was actually during the first part of my therapy, and for the first time in my life, I was 51, I started to have these very real thoughts of suicide. They would just jump into my head on a very regular basis, and frankly scared the crap out of me. I had always had some pretty severe opinions on people who did this sort of thinking or attempted suicide. So having them myself really rattled my cage. I, like I said, I had some very severe opinions. I thought they were, you know, this, this is for people who are weak and I am not one of those. How could I be having these thoughts? I couldn't control them and they came to me when I least expected it. 
They would even come to me during times when I was doing things I would enjoy, like out for a run or whatever, spending time with my dog, and they would jump into my head. I struggled to even get out of bed each day once these thoughts started to come. I felt shame to put on my uniform, something that I had always felt pride in doing. This did nothing for my state of mind and only served to worsen my suicidality. I was able to resist these thoughts of suicide over that spanned about a four-month period, but I felt incredible shame for even having them. I couldn't even share them with my therapist for the longest time, and this was a woman that I had told everything to. Somehow telling her about my suicidality was just a bridge too far. I could not share that with her for fear of the judgment. I certainly was not able to share it with Catherine for much till much later. So I was living with this incredible and intense pain in the center of my being. It permeated my chest and felt deeper than my entire body. And it wasn't a physical pain, it was an emotional pain that would not be controlled by the meds I was taking at the time, and that scared the heck out of me even more. I started to understand the thoughts of suicide as they became more serious, moving from ideation onto planning, method, setting dates, how I was going to do it, etc. I realized that I was thinking about suicide as it just might be the only way to make the pain go away. I was desperate and for the first time ever I felt my ability to live slipping. I found the strength to tell my therapist about these thoughts finally and almost instantly felt relief just by telling someone. I received no judgment. All I got was, tell me more. This was the first time I felt any sort of strength return to me in months. I carefully noted it and vowed to pay attention with the encouragement of my therapist. It took time before I could tell Catherine about it, about these thoughts, as I feared her judgment, despite the fact that I knew it would be the best thing to just tell her. Surprisingly, I didn't get the negative judgment I expected. In fact, what she said was, I'd like to go speak to your therapist. She wanted to engage with this particular issue finally. So having told Dr. Diskin and Catherine changed my reaction to suicidal thoughts. The thoughts still came to me regularly, and I can tell you that today they still come to me regularly. But the fact that I shared them with people that cared for me improved my ability to cope with them. So when I had them back then, they scared me and made me run out of the room. But when I have them today, it's just something that I note. And I asked my therapist, why do I still have these? I'm not suicidal. Why do, I, why do I still get these thoughts of suicide? And she said to me, sort of, well, you know what, Chris? Once you've had those thoughts and they've been a reality for you, they'll just, they just seem to continue to come. But what changes is how you react to them, how you think about them, what you do about it, how anxious you get. And now you have many more tools to deal with those things. So now I can tell you that when those thoughts come to me, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, there that is. Okay. That's, and then I'm reinforced by thinking about what I always think about, it, what Dr. Diskin told me. Yeah, they just will continue to come. Don't be alarmed. It doesn't mean that you're suicidal again, because I'm not. So speaking honestly about this one was one of the most significant learning experiences through my, in my treatment. After Afghanistan, I was started on antidepressants again and continued on sleep medication. These were required to basically glue my brain back together while I did the hard work in the therapy. So through my therapy and with Dr. Diskin, I learned many things. They were all about taking on board the honesty about this in, that this injury was about. It was about learning what my vulnerabilities were and accepting them. I am certain the word vulnerability was not, had not even been in my vocabulary to that point in my life at 51 years of age. The military is not interested in guys who are vulnerable. We're just not. We don't need that. It was an important discovery to find out that I could actually be a vulnerable man and still be a good officer, a good husband, a good father, a good son. Every one of us has vulnerabilities. I believe it is the enlightened that can accept them and move forward in life. 
So slowly over time, I started to realize what had happened to me in Rwanda and Afghanistan after countless exposures to pure and raw traumas to human beings and highly emotionally packed events. Witnessing countless dead people, including children lying in tall grass beside the road, having been cut down by machetes, did something very... In Afghanistan, a significant major stressor was the ongoing loss of Canadian and friendly troops. I had not experienced that before. In my first two deployments, we didn't have friendly losses. Now, all of a sudden, I was having young kids, the same age as my boys, come in on stretchers, only taking up half the stretcher. That did something profound to me. This is Anne Lear. She was the senior nurse of the uh, Roll 3 Combat Hospital that I worked with uh, side by side in one, during my tour. She's U.S. Navy. One of the other things that I had, we hadn't anticipated was having to deal with the incredible immaturity of our staff. And when I say immaturity, I don't mean they're uh, in that sense. I mean that they were brand new. Some of these kids, these med techs, these corpsmen that they sent to work in this incredibly emotionally packed facility had been in their military for less than 100 days. This was the first thing they were doing in their U.S. Navy career was coming and dealing with individuals who were blown to bits. So, and they were, this, they were younger than my kids, many of them. So Anne and I ended up being the mom and dad of this unit literally, not just, not just uh, XO and, and uh, senior nurse. We had to take care of not only the, the casualties that were coming in and their emotional needs and dealing with their leadership, but also we had to deal with the incredible young uh, staff that we had who were experiencing traumas, significant traumas, in, for the first time in their life. And I can tell you that they decompensated very, very quickly and struggled. And I would imagine many of them will eventually have PTSD. So it was like the, the machetes of Rwanda and the IEDs of Afghanistan also struck me. It's the way I felt. I believe it struck at my humanity and actually cleaved off my soul after those two experiences. At the time, I was in mission mode. Every soldier is familiar with the state as we can all adopt it at any time. When you think of what we are trained to do, fight wars, likely the dirtiest job known to man, we must protect ourselves in the moment and get the job done, and that is the way it should be. We need to be able to be in mission mode. What we might want to consider doing better is what we deal when we don't have to be in mission mode. My whole career, I've been in uniform 33 years, I've learned how to be an infantry soldier in my earlier years and then a medical guy. And I can tell you that not once, they've taught me how to do those jobs really well, but not once have I ever had a leader or a mentor that showed me by any stretch of the imagination, either verbally or, or demonstrated to me an ability to cope with, or sorry, an ability to deal with what we did that day. Never saw it, never. They always taught you, make sure you take care of your troops first, then take, don't forget yourself. But I never saw one of them take care of themselves. So I didn't, I didn't learn. I just thought what I learned was I need to do what they do, and essentially that is to ignore yourself. Self-sacrifice is what it's all about. And the more senior you go, the, more, the better you're at it, you, the better you are at it. So we worry about the damage later, and I can tell you that most of us never even consider that we will have to deal with it at all. I have learned it is generally the family that will recognize the signs, and all too often they don't know what to do with it either because they're either fearful or just have no clue. My thoughts as I wrote the book were that I was, was, that I was taking these memories, putting them in little boxes, and putting them on a shelf behind me, and I'll deal with them later. The way I thought I would deal with them was to just rely upon my ability to cope and to just continue to cope without any real plan whatsoever. Now, when I say that in my head, when I said that in my head, that made a lot of sense. But when I say it out loud to you, it makes absolutely no friggin' sense whatsoever. And I'm sure it doesn't make any sense to you. So essentially, there was no real plan other than to just continue to cope. 
So I believe that a level of acceptance and then submission to the healing process must take place. We also know that PTSD cannot ever be managed alone. It takes a community to manage PTSD. So if the community understands that this injury is quite normal for those impacted by traumas, they will demand that our troops get the treatment they need. If that attitude exists, the soldiers will feel better and feel fewer barriers to presenting themselves for care. The important part here is that it happens earlier in the cycle than later. Our son Jeffrey, seen here on patrol in Afghanistan, was feeling some hypervigilance and anxiety when he returned from Afghanistan, and he felt comfortable enough to speak with me about it. I recommended that he see his care delivery unit on base, and he did. He spoke to someone who could help him sort out these feelings quickly, and he has since moved on with his life and doing well. He knew that I would know what to do, I guess, given my recent history. I, that day, I was his family and his community, and as a result, he was able to get guidance without judgment. And that is exactly what our veterans and their families need. My therapy sessions lasted almost a year and a half and went twice a week for 90 minutes at a shot. They were excruciatingly painful. I received some of the best care available and I don't take it for granted, not for one single minute. I am walking, talking proof that what the Canadian Forces Health Services provides works. If you engage with it, if you submit to the process, do what they say and get honest about what is your injury and engage with those issues, no matter how difficult, you will come out standing up. So I became well enough to start to consider getting involved with group or peer activities involving similarly injured veterans. I attended the Outward Bound Veterans Program as well as Soldier on Events and eventually the Veterans Transition Program out of UBC, which was one of the most significant pivot points in my healing. I learned that I was not alone with my injury and this exposure coupled with the treatment I received on the base became incredible force multipliers for me. I felt my soul and my health return. When the CF deploys for long periods, it is clear that we are often exposed to bad things and they sometimes injure us very deeply. So deeply that these events often keep us from actually returning home. A stress injury can keep us locked up back on deployment for years and indeed a lifetime as many vets of previous wars will attest. If you are suffering silently, don't let this be your reality. I come back to the, in to the intent of this talk today and I will restate it as a message of hope to those veterans and their families who are struggling with PTSD or other stress injury. Think about what you have heard here today and see if you can see yourself in my experience. Take note of what happened to me, what, what I did right and what I did wrong. Maybe more importantly, focus on that. Perhaps something you heard will resonate with you and you might choose to make a change or even have that never before conversation with a loved one. Take from that what you will and go out and make life as good as you can make it for you and your family. This is about breaking that cycle of tragedy and learning a new way to finally return home to our loved ones and a happy life. You are worthy. And that's what I learned. I was actually worthy. I had to learn that I was worthy of being healthy again. And just coping, learning to cope, is not living. You have to do better than cope. You, ha you have to do better than just, oh, that's going to trigger me. I need to stay away from that. No, you need to get in there and own that trigger. Own what triggers you and move forward. That's where you transition from coping to living. So I'm thrilled to have had the opportunity to speak here today to you. I have served proudly uh, my country. I got injured while doing so. I got the care that I needed when I finally got to the point where I could ask for it. And I will depart the CF on January the 6th where I will be released, medically released because of my PTSD. For I am in breach of the universality of service policy. And I'm okay with that. I'm looking forward with clear eyes and a soul once again intact, so I am happy. I will, with my wife Catherine, continue on this journey 
to speak to veterans and their families any way we can. And I thank you again for your attention and your kind interest today. And I'm happy to entertain a question if you have. Thank you.